this is a project uh, I'm very excited about because uh, I think it provides a roadmap or uh, at the very least maybe proof of concept uh, for how the police can make progress in reducing violence uh, while sparing disadvantaged communities some of the costs that are associated with uh, the excesses of uh, policing. Uh, so this is research that's motivated by the story of a city uh, that found a way to reduce its homicide rate by 50% at a time when national homicide uh, rates were flat. In particular, I'm going to be talking about what happened in, in New York City uh, when a federal judge issued a ruling uh, that forced the city's police department to move away from a policing regime that was relying very heavily on the widespread use of street stops uh, and, and, and arrests to, to address crime and violence. And so pretty much overnight, uh, the police lost the, the means to apply what had been thought to be a really critical tool in maintaining public safety in the city. And so many people then feared, right, that the court ruling would lead to a new rise in crime. But instead, what happened was a shift in strategy uh, and really a golden age in public safety that lasted nearly a decade until uh, the pandemic um, brought that to a, a swift end. Um, so, um, All right, so I, I might be stating the obvious here, uh, but policing carries both costs and benefits. Um, uh, so there's a large and growing research literature that shows that investments in policing reduce crime, including uh, serious violence. Uh, crime goes down in response to greater police presence in an area. And crime declines when cities hire more police officers. So one uh, recent estimate is that for every 10 police officers hired in the US, uh, one murder is abated uh, each year. Um, but law enforcement, you know, so law enforcement works, uh, at least in its simplest form, it works as a blunt tool though, right? So every interaction uh, between a police officer and a citizen carries with it some risk, uh, both for the officer and for the citizen. Uh, and when cities hire more police, those officers uh, end up um, making a lot more arrests, especially low level sort of quality of life arrests for minor crimes these are crimes that don't often have a, a clear victim. And so while arresting people for these minor crimes is, is intended to make communities safer and more orderly, uh, the evidence suggests that when you prosecute people uh, for certain types of misdemeanor offenses and when you detain them in jail during the pendency of their trial, uh, that can actually backfire uh, with respect to public safety. And so really, you know, when you, when you sort of sum all this up, police, um, are, are a way to reduce violence, but they face a perpetual legitimacy crisis, right? In communities throughout the world, uh, people worry that disadvantaged communities end up being over-policed, but also under-protected. Uh, and so a natural question to ask here is, you know, can we have the benefits of policing uh, without, without the costs? Or, or maybe is, you know, is that too much to hope for? And maybe it is, right? Um, there's usually trade-offs in the world. And you know, even when efficiency gains are theoretically feasible, there's political constraints and operational challenges uh, that often tend to get in the way of progress. And, you know, fundamental change is, is always hard. And so I think it would be fair for any serious observer of this policy domain to sort of say, well, you know, I'm a pessimist, right? I, I think that's a fair uh, reaction. Um, but uh, this is not going to be a, a pessimistic talk. Uh, this is going to be an optimistic talk, because uh, I do think there are there are some reasons for optimism. Um, and, and those reasons are actually gonna be pretty instrumental for motivating the research that I'll, I'll talk about today. So, so first, as my discussant Thomas Apt uh, has said very eloquently many times, um, crime is highly concentrated, right? It's highly concentrated among a small number of people and in a small number of places. So in cities around the world, uh, a small uh, share of, of the blocks in, in, in a city account for a large share of the crimes. And a very, very small share of the population uh, uh, accounts for a large share of the crime, which is particularly true for violent crime. And that suggests that uh, a surgical crime control strategy just might work, right? You know, just given how concentrated things are. And second, uh, there's some new evidence, and this is, um, you know, some really exciting evidence out there that suggests that large numbers of street stops and arrests don't actually have a big impact on public safety. So in New York City, uh, when um, a new police precinct uh, captain um, comes to an area and, and changes the number of stops that are made by, by officers in that precinct, violence doesn't change, 
when police activity drops in the aftermath of a shooting of a police officer, there's no detectable short run crime response. And that's also good news, right? It's, it, it also suggests that something surgical might work, that you don't need uh, lots and lots of stops and arrests to keep the serious violence uh, down. So these are reasons I think we have to be uh, optimistic. And so ultimately, you know, can police right, meaningfully reduce serious violence without, um, while minimizing sort of the, the, the cost of policing to disadvantaged communities? And what happens when the police shift away from a policy of mass enforcement to something that's, that's much more surgical, uh, what I'll refer to as uh, precision uh, policing? Okay, so now I'm gonna return uh, to New York City uh, with, with that little brief intro uh, in, in the background. Um, to answer these questions in the context of a particular natural experiment that, that I think is informative. Um, so our paper is um, going to focus on um, coordinated gang raids uh, in and around uh, public housing communities in New York City, which is a strategy that the police in New York began to pursue when they could no longer rely on a mass stop question and frisk regime. Uh, and so we study what happens uh, to serious violence in these communities uh, after a gang raid, um, so after a gang takedown. And so while these gang takedowns are sometimes messy, right, there's, there's certainly uh, a lot of um, uh, issues with these takedowns, uh, this is a strategy that was just an order of magnitude more precise than the regime that preceded it. And as I'll show, the gang takedowns reduced shootings in these communities by about a third, uh, without using more low-level arrests or more street stops, and also without addressing any of the root causes of violence, right, which are always great to address, uh, but tend to be very hard to address, particularly in the short run. So um, that's, I think, the great promise uh, of this uh, type of strategy. Okay, so uh, as I've mentioned, the setting for the intervention is New York City. I'm going to motivate the research by providing uh, a little bit of background, uh, telling the story about what was happening in New York around this time, and then I'll, I'll talk about the intervention and what we, what we find. So I, I think it's fairly widely known now that New York uh, is the poster child for America's great crime decline in the 1990s. So uh, from 1990 to 1999, uh, homicides in the United States fell by about 45% nationally. They fell in many countries, not just the US, uh, but they fell by about 70% in New York City. And by the end of the decade, uh, by the end of the 1990s, New York had a homicide rate that was about five times, uh, uh, well, let me say, uh, I'll say it slightly differently. Uh, at the beginning of the 1990s, New York's homicide rate was five times higher than the national average. And by the end of the 1990s, uh, it was barely higher than the national average. So it, it's really a, a kind of a miracle. And so homicides do continue to fall in New York uh, after 1999, uh, but the rate of change is much, much slower and they really do begin to level off quite a bit. So I wanna focus on 2011, which is the year when the policy regime really begins to shift. And in 2011, New York really had uh, what most people would call a banner year. Uh, the city had had 2,200 homicides in 1990 at the peak of the crack epidemic uh, and just over 500 homicides in 2011. Uh, and by 2011, New York was one of the safest cities in the United States, um, a homicide rate that was only one third uh, that of Chicago. And so it was widely assumed by a lot of people that you know pushing the homicide rate any lower than this was, was gonna be really difficult. Um, you know, Murders were down uh, by, by, by a lot. The city hadn't really addressed any of the root causes. Uh, New York City remained and continues to remain deeply segregated with deep pockets of social isolation and poverty. Uh, unlike cities in Western Europe, uh, New York uh, is, uh, was, and probably always will be awash in illegal guns. Um, so all of that was still um, you know, present in the background. Um, but you know, the, the police department was doing their best to keep uh, crime low and, and to keep crime going down. And the, and the approach that they decided was gonna um, help to make this possible was making a lot of street stops. So between 2002 and 2011, uh, New York City police uh, went from making 100,000 street stops a year to 700,000 street stops a year. And many people assumed that this was effective because crime was going down uh, during the same time. 
So in August 2011, the city's mass enforcement regime came to an end. And it came to an end when a federal judge sent a powerful signal to the city's political leadership that uh, the policy of making lots and lots of these street stops, lots and lots of these low level arrests was, was racially discriminatory and probably illegal. Um, so basically what happened is a, a federal judge declined to dismiss a lawsuit that was filed by a number of plaintiffs um, that alleged that the New York City Police Department was discriminatory in enforcement action. Um, and while the case wouldn't conclude for another two years, the city really got the message that the judge sent in 2011. Street stops declined almost immediately. And within five years, the number of recorded street stops had fallen by more than 90%. And you know, some of this is probably just, you know, people, uh, police just not documenting all the stops, but that is uh, not the principal reason why the graph looks the way it does. Street stops really did decline um, a whole lot. So the judge's ruling was criticized by, by many people in the city. Um, so the police commissioner, uh, the, the mayor of New York City at the time, Michael Bloomberg, uh, referred to the decision as dangerous. Um, police officials worried that without the threat of a street stop, the deterrence value of policing would plummet and offenders might begin carrying guns again. Police would lose a critical tool uh, that they have in their arsenal to win back control of the city's streets. And at the time, you know, these fears were bolstered by some academic research um, that suggested that um, order maintenance policing was effective that I, I think has since been effectively uh, called into question. So, you know, when you think about the history here, what happened after 2011 was, was really unexpected by, by most people. So from 2011 until the beginning of the pandemic, um, while homicide rates were, were flat or actually increasing a little bit nationally, New York City uh, experienced what, what I'm calling a second great crime decline. And while many people know about the miracle that happened in the 1990s, the interesting thing is a lot of people don't seem to know uh, about what happened in the last 10 years. Uh, it seems to be really widely underappreciated. And this is what happened. Uh, shootings uh, and homicides both declined by more than 50%, right? If I juked the y-axis a little bit, uh, I could make it seem even more impressive, right? But that's that's a really incredible uh, drop in, in in homicide when you when you think about the fact that New York had already um, seen a large decrease in, in homicide, and when you think about national trends, you, know, you can really you can really think about how impressive this is. In the in the 1990s, you know, homicide was going down everywhere in the, in the developed world. It was going down a little bit more in New York. Uh, in the last decade, homicide fell by 50% in New York, but it was actually, if anything, rising a little bit in the rest of the United States. And so if you think about where New York landed, uh, it landed around you know, less than four homicides per 100,000 people, uh, which meant that New York compared quite favorably to some capitals in Western Europe, like London and, and Paris, and certainly looked a lot more like London or Paris or Amsterdam or Stockholm than it did, um, let's say Philadelphia or Chicago. And so looking back, um, this is a headline from 2018 in the National Review, which is a, a very prominent conservative periodical in the United States. The National Review uh, published an op-ed saying we were wrong about stop, question, and risk, um, which, is, which is really uh, interesting. So um, what caused this second great crime decline? Um, you know, it's always impossible to offer a complete explanation to a question like this. It's, it's hard to explain uh, why the world uh, is the way it is. Uh, but, but I think there are some things that we can say. So it's probably not something like gentrification, um, you know, wealthier people moving to the city. Uh, homicides fell in every area of the city, um, especially in many of the city's most impoverished neighborhoods, which um, hadn't gentrified and often and really still haven't gentrified. Um, it's not demographic changes. Uh, those changes have actually been pretty slow. The city uh, remains a very diverse uh, uh, place. And it's not the size of the police force or the amount of money that the police force had in, in their budget, which has been roughly constant relative to population. But there is really, there is one big clue. Because when we think about the second great crime decline in New York, it's really a great homicide decline. So during the last decade, uh, other crimes in New York City are broadly following national trends. 
Um, this is a crime decline that's very specific to homicide. And in particular, it's mostly driven by one particular kind of homicide, which is gang homicide. And so, you know, I think that's a clue in the background that um, this isn't just like a rising tide that uh, raises all ships, uh, that, that this is something that's, that's very specific to um, a crime that's very concentrated among a small number of people uh, and places. So I want to talk now about the new regime, uh, and then I'll talk about the particular intervention we're studying and, and what we find. Um, so when the federal courts signaled to New York City that its approach to policing was not constitutional, the city shifted to a new policing, policing regime. And it was one that was intended to be much more precise, uh, to focus on the small number of people and the small number of places. Um, it was intended to be much more surgical. And so in, in 2012, uh, the NYPD initiated two uh, policies that were part of this new regime. Um, the first is something called Operation Crew Cut, which doubled the size of the city's anti-crime, uh, anti-gang units. They also reintroduced uh, the gang database. Uh, so this is just a list of gang members or alleged gang members citywide. Um, and really the, the police commissioner and other um, social planners in the city made it clear that the idea here was not simply to target the big gangs like the Bloods and the, Cru and, and the Crips. Um, the idea was to also go after smaller crews, um, loosely affiliated groups of, of teenagers who often identify themselves based on the blocks where they live and really are responsible for an outside share of the violence, particularly in New York City's public housing uh, communities. And so the idea here was to engage in a series of gang takedowns where in one uh, moment, um, as many alleged gang members were um, uh, arrested as, as possible and, and incapacitated. Um, that was the idea here. So gang takedowns is not a, a legal term. It's not a technical term. Um, it's really a colloquial expression that's used in media reports and among members of, of law enforcement. Um, to describe these highly coordinated targeted raids on alleged um, gang members, again, often centered around the city's public housing communities. So this is um, a partnership between the police and also the prosecutors. It's not just a policing intervention. And the explicit goal here um, was to build these large scale conspiracy cases. These are cases that implicate not only individuals who were actually the perpetrators of violence themselves, but also people who were in the gang and might have helped to facilitate uh, that criminal activity or related criminal activity. So um, for example, a particular gang member might be charged with a murder, but other members of the gang could then be charged with conspiracy to commit murder under the theory that they were involved in its planning. Um, or with activities that ultimately supported the gang as a criminal enterprise. And so the arrests uh, that were made were, were made very closely in time. Um, you know, the idea was to go in and grab um, all the people who um, were under arrest so they couldn't, um, you know, escape or anything like that. Um, and it has a very big demonstration effect. So some of these raids are very big with uh, more than 100 people arrested at once. Uh, most are a lot smaller than that. Um, but yeah, the idea is to try to, I think, maximize, um, you know, the, the, um, the visibility uh, of, these, of these raids. So just as the city was relying less on street stops, it was tamping up the number of gang takedowns uh, in the city. And this is something that, that really was noticed. Uh, so this is an article in the New York Times in 2013. Um, you can see the headline, frisking tactic yields to a focus on youth gangs. So uh, people were taking notice that the police were doing something very different almost overnight than what they'd been, do what they'd been doing previously. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the setting for this um, research is public housing in New York City. Um, perhaps uh, people here haven't been to New York City, or if you have, maybe you went to Times Square and you saw the Statue of Liberty, but you never went up and walked around uh, public housing. And, and I forgive you for, for uh, not doing that, but just to give you a sense for what, the, what these communities look like. Um, so these are areas that are um, uh, uh, economically challenged. Um, uh, they have a great deal of poverty. They have an outsized share of the crime. Um, 
you know, but they're, they're pretty tightly knit communities. Uh, people often live in these communities for many years, uh, often multiple generations uh, of the same family. Uh, physically, they look a little bit like a cluster of dorms on a college campus. Um, there are high rise buildings that are, that are inset uh, from the street. So what we do is we identify um, over a hundred gang takedowns that occur uh, within a public housing community. Uh, there are other takedowns as well. We don't study those because it's very hard to know where to expect the crime declines. Uh, so we study communities that are um, where, where gangs are very, very closely tied uh, to these places. Now, when you, when you look at who's arrested as part of the takedowns, uh, the demographics are, are pretty clear. Uh, disproportionately, the arrestees are young black men. Uh, so about 20% of New York City's population is black. Uh, among the people who are arrested in gang takedowns, uh, nearly two thirds are black. Um, and that broadly tracks the demography of, of shooting victims in the city, uh, but it's also been the source of a lot of criticism of, of these gang raids. And so, you know, I, I just wanna make sure people are, are aware of that. Um, many of the arrestees are young, but actually only, only about 8% are below the uh, age of 18 um, and, and half are over the age of 25. So um, disproportionately, it's not the youngest gang members who are, who are being targeted, it's people who are uh, a little more experienced and, and tend to have um, you know, longer criminal records. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly talk about the research design. I'm gonna keep it high level. And if there are questions about the details, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get into what we, what we find, which I think is pretty exciting. Um, so we have data uh, uh, from in New York from 2011 going uh, forward to the end of 2019. Uh, obviously in 2020, things uh, changed uh, quite a bit. Uh, and we're gonna focus on the subset of public housing developments that, that experienced at least one gang takedown during this period. The other developments uh, are very different uh, they have different populations uh, and they experience pretty different crime trends in, in the prior uh, period. And so to avoid um, confounding by broader crime trends more generally, uh, what we're gonna do in our, in our main models is focus on a two year bandwidth around the, the first uh, takedown that happened at, at a given housing uh, development. So the primary question is just gonna be, did, did crime decline? Um, in the aftermath of a gang takedown. And we're gonna leverage the potentially arbitrary timing uh, of, of when the takedown happened. And, you know, especially if there's a, there are economists in the room, you might all already be thinking, well, why would the timing of this be arbitrary? That, that seems uh, implausible. Um, you know, it could be, right, that the city is uh, timing the takedowns to coincide with where crime is rising. And, and that would certainly uh, make a lot of sense. And that's a reasonable concern. Uh, but in practice, these takedowns are, are only happening after months or even years of investigation. Uh, they're not being timed to coincide with rising violence so much. It's much more about when the legal elements are in place uh, to make uh, a conspiracy arrest, when a prosecutor feels like this, this is something that could be done, when a judge signs off on, on these arrest warrants. Um, and so when we examine the, the crime trends leading up to the takedowns, we really don't see any evidence uh, that there's pre-trends. And actually, you know, even beyond that, there's not a whole lot of evidence in general that the order of the takedowns is related to the uh, levels of crime and violence in these communities. Now that might sound bad for the efficiency of the intervention, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, there are a lot of high value targets in a city the size of New York uh, and there's binding resource constraints. So, um, you know, there are a lot of people that, that could be um, uh, being targeted. Um, so this is a, a differences in differences uh, research design. Uh, we pair it with an event study. We run a series of uh, Poisson regression models of the count of crimes on an indicator for whether a time period um, is either before the takedown happened or after the takedown happened. Um, and we control for a lot of fixed effects to think about all the other things that are happening um, in New York around this time. So what do we find? Um, we find large declines in serious violence in the aftermath of a takedown. And I'm just gonna present the results uh, graphically here because I think it's just much easier to see than a, than a regression table. Um, so after a takedown, 
Uh, our best estimate is that there's a 55% decline in homicides and a 33% decline in shootings. Now, these are rare events. These are, are fairly small communities. So the homicide result is not quite statistically significant. We just have a lot of uncertainty about exactly what that estimate um, is. But the result for shootings, which are more common than homicides, because most people do survive um, if they're shot, about 80% of people survive, um, that result is statistically significant. Now, we don't observe declines in less lethal violence uh, that are significant. We see something like maybe an 8 or 9% decline in, in, in uh, assaults that are not shootings. That's not significant. We don't see a change in robberies or in property crimes. And in many ways, this is exactly what we would have expected, right? Uh, things like non-shooting assaults are actually not as concentrated. A lot of this is domestic violence. It happens behind closed doors. It's unfortunately more common than we'd all like it for, for it to be. But the things like shootings and homicides, that is super concentrated among a small number of people. Often the police have a decent sense of who those people are. And these are the crimes that, that end up being you know, highly sensitive to this intervention. The other stuff, uh, not so much. And so importantly, and this is, I think, really key, the large decline in violence is not accompanied by a sustained increase in law enforcement activity. So it's not like there's a takedown and then there's a permanent army of police officers in the area stopping lots of people and making lots of arrests. And here's what we see. So if anything, uh, police enforcement is going down after a takedown. The most discretionary types of arrests, uh, so for drug possession and particularly for marijuana possession, are actually declining after a takedown happens. And so it looks like the NYPD was able to reduce shootings. So the most costly types of crime that create you know, a lot of the trauma in these communities by about a third. And they're able to do that without wrapping more and more people up in, you know, within the net of the criminal justice system. So this is an approach that really is very surgical especially compared to what uh, came before it. Uh, now you might wonder, you know, was crime simply pushed around the corner? Uh, you know, you have these gang takedowns in, in these public housing communities, maybe the crime spills out somewhere else. Um, we see no evidence of this. Uh, what we do is we look in adjacent areas. Uh, so places that were right next door to the public housing development. We also look at other public housing developments because um, we know that sometimes there's retaliatory shootings uh, people from one housing development uh, in a gang war with people from another housing development. If anything, we actually see some evidence that nearby housing developments also see a decline in, in violence. Um, it's nothing that's statistically significant, so I won't make any strong claims about it. Uh, but we certainly don't see evidence that crime is just being pushed out to other areas. Um, if you think about the ethnography of these places, uh, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, these are gangs that are strongly, strongly tied to place. Um, it's not like if you go two blocks away, uh, there's a place that, that's equivalent. Um, this is where they live. This is home. And you can't easily go to another housing development. That would be a very dangerous thing to do uh, for a gang to try to move over to another uh, housing development. So we do a lot of robustness checks. A lot of this stuff is very New York City specific, so I won't get into this right now. But uh, basically, there's, there's no way to make these results uh, go away. Uh, so I, I think I have a few more minutes. Um, and um, I just want to talk a little bit about what, what I think these results mean. And then uh, we'll hear from, from Thomas, and, and he'll uh, give us the real answer. Um, so just to summarize, uh, you know, these gang takedowns led to a large decline in gun violence, but not other types of crimes. Um, really, really, this, this is, is very focused on gun violence. Um, overall, uh, this probably explains something like a quarter of the decline in violence in these communities during uh, this decade-long period, uh, and probably about 10% of the decline citywide. Uh, now, maybe 10% doesn't seem like a big number to you, uh, but I, I want to just be clear that this is um, a subset of this precision policing um, shift in regime. Uh, so we're studying a subset of public housing developments. Um, among other public housing developments. Uh, and there's also um, gang takedowns that happen that don't have an access to public housing. And then there's all sorts of other things the police department is doing that aren't gang takedowns that are still part of this precision policing package. So I think if anything, this is a lower bound estimate 
uh, on the value of a precision policing pro approach more, more generally. So um, when we think about uh, the policy implications here, I, I think the findings suggest that these surgical policing tactics can have uh, a big payoff. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really proof of concept um, that you can make, make a big difference with respect to violence uh, in, in communities where violence is endemic um, in ways that don't require addressing root causes, in ways that don't require hiring more police officers. Uh, potentially, if this is done well, this is something that could be used to improve police legitimacy because you're, you know, getting some of the bad guys off the street and you're not um, subjecting people to more and more street stops and more and more uh, arrests. However, right, um, there's no panaceas here. Um, uh, and I think observers should, should be aware of, of some uh, shortcomings here and some uh, sources of uncertainty. So first, uh, the treatment effects do not last forever. Um, we find that, that these effects last for up to 18 months after an initial gang takedown, uh, but the violence then starts to tamp back up uh, after 18 months. Um, so the data suggests that these gang takedowns offer a means of temporarily relieving the symptoms of the disease rather than offering a permanent cure. Um, second, uh, you know, advocates and legal scholars have raised uh, concerns about uh, due process that um, sometimes uh, people are arrested, they're accused of being part of the gang, they're charged with a, a conspiracy um, account, and maybe they're, they're not really gang members, they just know a few of the people in the gang and they sit in jail for a long time while the legal system sorts this out. Uh, and there are real fairness concerns uh, to an approach like this. So, you know, I would call this precision policing. It's not so clear that it's precision prosecution. Uh, and then finally, uh, whether this is replicable in other cities and other places, I think is very much an open question. I think it's so important to think about repli replicability uh, when, whenever it comes to any kind of crime intervention that we care about. Uh, this is a, uh, something that really takes a lot of um, skill by the police, a lot of skill uh, by, the, by the prosecutors, and a lot of cooperation between police and prosecutors. And there's certainly places where um, that kind of cooperation would be, would be difficult to um, facilitate. So, you know, I don't think this is, this is something that's so easy to do, uh, but when you can do it, I, th I think it really can pay, um, uh, can pay off. And so uh, just to sum up, I, I hope I'm not over, but this is my last slide. Um, so what you're looking at here is a picture of Al Capone uh, and a picture of um, a fictional uh, a, a gangster, Marlo Stanfield uh, from the TV show, The Wire. Um, you know, because, uh, and I, I chose this, this picture for a reason that if you haven't seen The Wire, it's really a show about um, good versus bad policing. And I, I think what a lot of the research tells us is that policing matters, uh, that good policing that's sensitive to the needs of a community and focuses on um, developing the patience and skill to build major cases against people who are committing the violence can, can really be transformative and save you know, scores of innocent lives. On the other hand, bad policing uh, that's exemplified by an excessive focus on, on quick rips uh, that may not translate well, but um, you know, just making lots of low level arrests just to show people that you're doing something uh, that can do more harm than good. And so I think by investing in good policing, uh, some more effective gang enforcement, uh, training uh, to build major cases, more resources, resources for gun violence investigations, I think that's a way that policymakers can double down on the benefits of police, what the things that police are really good at doing while reducing um, or at least minimizing, uh, let's say the costs uh, of policing. Um, so hopefully I wasn't over, um, but thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your listening. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to comment on, on uh, Aaron's excellent work here. Can you all see my screen? Okay, great. Fantastic. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, be with you in particular to discuss this important subject and this important work. So I want to just begin with a bunch of uh, um, positive uh, comments uh, about, uh, about this excellent study. And then um, because we're all more interested in questions and critique, I'm going to raise some questions 
uh, about the work uh, in a friendly in a in a in a friendly way because I do think the study overall is very strong and very important. And then I'm going to conclude with some takeaways, uh, uh, potential takeaways for uh, Latin America. So first off, you know, it, this is a really well done study with uh, some of uh, 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 that examines an important question and comes up with an important answer. Uh, you know, it's part of an over, uh, a body of literature that strongly suggests that police can reduce violent crime um, and that police are an overall, uh, an important part of an overall anti-violence solution. And I think Aaron is careful to note that the effects are prob could probably best be described as moderate and time limited. So this is not the only thing a city uh, can or should be doing uh, in its anti-violence efforts, but it suggests that um, as I've said elsewhere, that policing is necessary but not sufficient for effective violence reduction. Uh, I think another key takeaway is that uh, policing is most effective and most legitimate when it's highly targeted, when it's focused on the highest risk people and places. Uh, and that's consistent with a, a large body of literature. Um, the lack of displacement finding uh, is really important. Um, you know, one of the key sort of concerns about these targeted approaches is that if you target in one place or among one set of people, then the violence will just move somewhere else. And this is yet another finding that displacement uh, effects are uh, minimal and sometimes even positive. Uh, so that's an important thing. And I would also just say that uh, this were, uh, this, these findings echo a lot of the, our findings um, that we've been uh, looking at, at in the Council on Criminal Justice's Violent Crime Working Group, particularly focused on law enforcement solutions. So I've just uh, 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 a little plug here to go check out that work. So now let's sort of examine some of the sort of questions. And some of these are with the study itself, but some of them are in this sort of broader policy section. And, you know, Aaron cites a, a, a lot of literature uh, about sort of the effectiveness of policing generally. And, and, and that literature is important and exists, but there is this, I would say, a narrower thesis to some of that literature that I think is more debatable which is the more police equals less crime question. There's evidence in this, uh, there's lots of evidence in, in favor of this, uh, uh, of this idea that you know, an additional police officer reduces, uh, reduces crime by X, uh, X or Y amount. But there's not that many sort of systematic reviews in this area. And for me personally, uh, the sort of final policy answers for me often come with a systematic review of the literature um, that really, you know, in a very transparent way wraps its arms around all of the literature. And, you know, the, the systematic review that we have in this area suggests that the overall size of the police force is not the sort of major factor, but that policing strategy is. Now, obviously, if a, if a uh, police agency is severely undermanned, we have a, rec a massive recruitment challenge and retention challenge in the United States right now. That's a big problem and you have to address that. But beyond some uh, uh, minimum level, um, I would like to suggest that, uh, that manpower is really not the question. It's that police do matter, but it's what they do matters that rather than how many there, uh, there are above some minimum level, of course. Um, you know, I think New York City is a is a is a incredibly important place in the American criminal justice conversation, but it's also a very unusual place. Uh, you know, New York City um, is not necessarily representative of crime control policy uh, generally in the United States. For instance, um, there really, to my knowledge, are not are no other police departments in the United States using this term precision policing. This is an, a, a new term and it's a New York City specific term. Um, you know, the more general term is often sort of, uh, you know, as, as Aaron notes is, you know, hotspots policing, problem oriented policing and precision policing is arguably in sort of one uh, version of those things. But New York City is exceptional for many reasons. It's size, uh, it's wealth, uh, 
uh, the vast array of uh, criminal justice capacity in, in the city. Uh, I, was, I, I was the head of public safety for New York State under Andrew Cuomo. And after moving from Washington to uh, back to New York to uh, rejoin the New York criminal justice community, uh, there really just is no other place that I've ever been on the planet which has as many experts in criminal justice in one place. And so I think that that's sort of important to understand that you know what happens in New York City is not necessarily rec replicable um, all around the world. Um, I'm intrigued by, I'd love to hear a little bit more about why housing uh, projects were chosen in, in particular some of the housing projects because there were, uh, according to the, uh, to the paper, there were actually, you know, 455 examples of these takedowns, but, uh, but Aaron selected 73. Now there's certainly good reasons to do that, but it just left me very curious about what were the results in the non-housing areas and this open question of what well, did, is there something special about the combination of precision policing and housing? And the other thing I think we have to acknowledge is that, um, as uh, Aaron just mentioned, uh, New York City has experienced a massive increase in gun violence uh, in, uh, in the past uh, year or so. That is true of uh, almost all cities in the country, but it's, and, and so it's not, it's not unique to New York City. But New York City was not spared that general trend. And so I think that sometimes, somehow, I think we need to parse that and what that means. It certainly doesn't negate these results by any means, but I think it's something that's worth considering. I also think this, the, I think there's a real sort of, you know, I think people in the field of criminology and criminal justice are really grappling with this, uh, this term gangs. And it increasingly, uh, this sort of notion of gangs is seen as an outdated term that's uh, poorly understood, poorly defined, and can often lead to bad policy. And so, for instance, focused deterrence doesn't use the term gang anymore. It uses groups and social networks because those are actually more accurate. And it gets us away from this notion of a traditionally hierarchical gang where, you know, there's a, there are ranks and captains and orders are given and, and those things, which is, while that exists, uh, well, that very much exists in certain parts of Latin America, um, that is not that common in the United States. It happens in the United States, but the vast, the overwhelming majority of gang, gang violence is quite informal, as, uh, as Aaron said. And so really, you know, the problem here is that, you know, uh, is that if you use a broad term, you get broad policies and you get this net widening effect. And so, and so gang, termini gang terminology emphasizes who people are rather than what they do. And that's a problem because while there are many, many gangs and gang members, arguably that uh, in the United States, a, a surprisingly small minority of those people are highly violent. And so while there are, um, uh, you know, uh, there are even, even among gangs and gang members, there are certain gangs that are particularly violent and there are certain gang members that are particularly violent. And what's most important is the violence, not their affiliation as gang members. So just something to think about. Um, and I just want to point out that while New York City uses these terms of gangs, they're actually doing the right thing in staying very, uh, very focused. And I just want to point out that I think that this strategy is much more like the focused deterrence strategy than the gang injunction strategy that's used out of LA. Um, and uh, something to, just something to know. I also want to right, um... talk... I'm so sorry to interrupt, Thomas. We want to leave some time for questions of the audience as well. So if you can start closing, that would be great. Sure. Sorry about that. So here are the takeaways for uh, for Latin America. I, I believe, um, having done some work in, in in the region, I think the first and uh, first thing is to focus on the violence, meaning homicides and shootings, and not gangs or drugs. Focus on the violence directly, and stay focused on the most violent people and places. Uh, 
take, uh, you know, um, take, take this idea that police matter, but that the strategy matters more than the actual size of the police force. I also think that in terms of reducing impunity, which I think is the number one public safety problem in the region, uh, this notion of police pro uh, prosecutor collaboration is absolutely critical. And that conspiracy charges, which have been instrumental in the United States, not just in addressing violence, but in dismantling organized crime, uh, it was, it's a key tool in the United States. Not all Latin American countries have this tool in their prosecutorial toolbox. And so that's something that's very important. I do believe that this is a replicable strategy. I think that this is in some ways uh, asks less than some of the more sophisticated evidence informed uh, strategies that, uh, that come out of the United States, but there are limitations. Uh, you know, collaboration is difficult, getting the right data is difficult. The differing nature of violence um, in that, you know, in, in Latin America, um, organized crime is much more highly structured than it is in the United States, and we need to acknowledge that massive difference. And also it's occurring in this context in certain areas of the, uh, of the region of massive impunity, meaning that there are huge systematic and institutional challenges uh, to uh, delivering these. Thank you.